Good afternoon, it's afternoon, it's fair to say yes. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to East Energy's tech series. It's our monthly thought leadership event. And uh, yeah, we're happy to have you. It's the first one we're trying this time for the ones that have been here with us before. Usually we're doing an evening session. So please let us know as well if you like the timing and if we should keep doing it at lunchtime. Um, just uh, for those of you who don't know eSynergy, just a quick introduction. We're a technology consultancy and we focus on delivering business value from and across uh, three many areas. Uh, that's cloud adoption. And here's, as you see, everything from assessments to optimization and scale, uh, cloud native and the data and analytics side of things. Um, and across those three, we've supported organizations like HMRC, HMPO, um, Department for Education and other main, uh, major central government organizations, but also uh, private sector businesses like NatWest or, or WorldPay, for instance. Um, as a business, we work with a contractor model. We call them associates, um, as we believe it's far more fluid and effective way to provide support around business and technology problems. Uh, as we go out to the market and find technologists that have the exact skills uh, and experience that our clients require. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Ulrika, I should have introduced myself first. I'm Ulrika, I'm looking after marketing here, here at Synergy. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, so we have Himmel with us. He's gonna talk about the future of Gov.UK's architecture strategy. Himmel is the head of technology for Gov.UK at the Government Digital Service. And uh, without further ado, Himmel, if I, uh, Stop sharing screen and, and over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, and thanks to you at East Energy for uh, hosting me here today. Um, so great to have you all here. Um, I think I've seen a few uh, familiar names there as well. So to the people I know, hello. Um, that puts me on the spot a little bit. Um, so I'm Hemel Mandalia. I'm head of technology for Gov.uk at GDS. So I've been in that role for just over six months. And uh, Prior to that, um, I worked in government digital circles for about seven years in a number of different roles, developer, technical architect, and uh, tech advisor. And some of you uh, on the call that know me uh, will have worked with me in some of those roles, which is, which is quite nice. So this is what I want to cover today, um, the agenda for what I'll be doing in this talk. And I've got about half an hour, probably a bit less, um, with questions. A lot to go over, so I'm going to dive straight in. So I'm going to do an intro to the Government Digital Service, or GDS. Um, then I want to talk about Gov.UK, what it is and the bit of it that I want to cover. And then the heart of this presentation, the talk, um, is going to be the architecture strategy for Gov.UK, what it means for where we want to go next and the future. Uh, and then finally, a few minutes for questions. Um, and I'll be sharing some contact information as well if anyone else wants to pick up. Any further questions, I'm happy to handle that um, outside of this. So um, let's crack on. So before I dive into the future architecture strategy, I want to cover off a bit of background, starting with where I work. So the Government Digital Service, um, and I think a lot of you will be familiar with GDS, but for those who aren't, I'm going to do a quick intro to the organization and what we do. It's a good scene tester as well. So GDS builds and runs the common components and platforms that help provide a joined up experience of government for everyone. We offer these up as products and services across government. GDS builds common components and platforms that help provide a joined up experience. Um, and we offer these up as products and services across government. So GDS is a part of the cabinet office. We've got offices in London, Bristol, and Manchester. Since we were set up in 2011 and, um, Heads up, it's our 10th birthday in December, which is uh, just crazy that it's been around that long. Um, we've been helping government transform to be more user-centric. So agile, iterative approaches uh, grounded in solid principles of service design, continuous improvement, focus on empowered multidisciplinary teams, all of that. So we've done a lot since 2011. I'm going to briefly touch on a few um, achievements here. So there's... Gov.uk itself, which was a gargantuan task at the time, setting up Gov.uk meant moving nearly 2,000 different government websites into one with a consistent design and experience. 
So since October 2012, when Gov.uk went live, there's been more than 10 billion sessions and um, 27 billion page views. So at GDS, we've also got our government as a platform or GAP suite of products. So these are common components that solve common problems, you know, things like notifications and payments, which just need to be done well once and then reused, leaving teams across government to concentrate on building the features which deliver value to their users. So a good example of one of those is um, Gov.uk Notify, which is used around 4,000 services across 1,000 public sector organizations. So that's departments and agencies. Um, it sent its 2 billion notification during the coronavirus response. So it's you know, simple, lightweight email and SMS notifications all wrapped up as a reusable service. It actually sends letters as well, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, so GDS has also had international renown. Um, we've had recognition for the digital government work. Um, it's come second in the OECD's Digital Government Index. Last October, the um, UN's e-government survey um, said that the UK and Northern Ireland has developed Gov.uk based on the build once and reuse principle. So a concept that's become one of the most popular whole of government conceptual frameworks for service provision in the world. I'm sort of quoting there, so that's some pretty lofty praise. Um, and of course, I'm bigging up GDS. As well as recognition, uh, recognition um, we've seen our work um, emulated around the world. So there's some examples of um, government websites from other countries. So we work in the open at GDS. Um, we do this about talking about our work through blog posts, events, podcasts, and public roadmaps. Our design principles and documentation are openly available and most of our code repositories on GitHub are open, which means anyone can fork and reuse our code. So, of course, we work in a government environment, so there are certain sensitivities about sharing some aspects of our work, but working in the open as much as possible is something we value at GDS and uh, also why we're doing events like um, this one today. After covering off a bit of background to GDS, um, I'm going to jump in here. So, yes, we've done a lot of great work today. We've got an ambitious future strategy for the duration of the current parliament to 2024. So this was launched in a blog post back in May by our CEO, Tom Reid. That gave GDS a clear vision. We want to build a simple, joined up and personalized experience of government for everyone. We plan to use our unique position at the center of government to develop services that just work for the user to have a complex the underlying systems are. We've got five missions to deliver against, all of which can be read on the uh, aforementioned blog post. Um, if you just search for GDS strategy, it should come up as the top result. And from that strategy, I want to uh, talk about the bits that support this vision. So um, it's missions one and two, which is, which is gov.uk as the single and trusted online destination for government information and services and joined up services that solve whole problems and span multiple departments. So by transforming gov.uk's infrastructure and architecture, we can deliver a proactive and personalized experience across different devices and channels while being accurate, accessible, stable, and secure. So now that I've covered GDS and its strategy, I want to give a brief history and intro to gov.uk before we dive into its future architecture strategy. So first of all, what is gov.uk? There's a few layers to unpick here. So put simply, gov.uk is the digital home for the UK government. It's the digital interface between the government and the people it serves. And millions of people visit the site daily. Some stats from August show 5 million on an average day. And it's used for routine tasks and complex, complex tasks. People might be coming to apply for a passport or to simply check the latest lockdown rules. I think luckily a lot of that's behind us now, I hope. Um, so this is how Gov.uk is today. I'm going to go back in time quickly just to see how we got here. So this is a bit of the history I mentioned a few slides back since 2012 when Gov.uk launched, consolidated about 2,000 different government websites into one. So you had things like DirectGov, BusinessLink, and hundreds of others, and it replaced them all with one website to rule them all. So that's Gov.uk. But more than that, so the wider sense, Gov.uk is a brand and proposition shared by hundreds of services delivered across government. So they all share that consistent look and feel and provide a single front-end user experience. There's a little montage here. 
And this is showing a lot of transactional services. So we made sure that transactional services, that's the things that you want to do with government, like pay your taxes or check your driver's license, renew your passport. We're on the same brand and available via gov.uk. And there's hundreds of these that share this single consistent look and feel that are on the gov.uk brand and proposition. There's a few more here. And this was all made possible with clear and simple standards. So that's the service standard and common components that made it easy for service teams across government to get it right first time. It's a great example. That's the gov.uk design system, which provides easy to use templates and styles. If you use those, you can't, you can't, really, you can't really do it wrong. So the applications themselves, these transactional services, they could be developed in whichever technologies the respect, respective departments were comfortable with. But they all start on gov.uk with start pages. Here's a gener generic example of a start page. So while those transactional services like booking your prison, uh, visit booking, renew your, renewing your passport, they're not run by us, we do host their start pages, which is the jumping off point. Wherever the individual services are hosted, whatever technologies they're developed in, they all jump off from the same point. So that's the wider brand and proposition. So I want to circle back to what is gov.uk, that question, and the bit we're talking about here. Well, the bit I'm specifically looking at here is what you see when you go to www.gov.uk and what's behind that. So that's what delivers the half a million pages of content, everything from extensive coronavirus guidance to information on how you'd go about um, keeping a micro pig as a pet, which is a real page on gov.uk you can look up, I was told about on my first day. So everything on www.gov.uk is supported by about 70 applications and components along with infrastructure. And we run and own those 70 things in-house at GDS. So these are things like Mainstream and Whitehall. Those are two different publishing applications for different sets of users. So content designers and GDS use Mainstream. Content designers across government use Whitehall. Here's a high-level view of the applications and architecture. This slide's just to give an idea of the size and complexity. You're not meant to really look at all the detail. If you are interested, um, you can view that on our publicly uh, available developer docs, and you can get in touch with me for a link on those. So these applications and the architecture has grown and evolved over the last decade, and we've spawned multiple front-end and publishing apps to meet emerging needs. And of course, um, as is common in any long-running run service like this, or set of services, we've picked up our fair share of technical debt, things that become difficult or tricky to change. But the transformation work we're about to start isn't, is going to give us an opportunity to uh, sort of prune some dead leaves and branches, so to think, so to think and really rethink um, this architecture from the ground up. So now that I've cleared up what I mean by gov.uk, and we've just focused on those sort of 70 applications and components that serve the half a million pages, um, how does it all work? What does it do? How's content created? How's it published? How's it served up through gov.uk? And so here's a super simplified flow for what we call mainstream content on gov.uk. So that's the content that's aimed at the general public or a general business audience. It kind of goes like this where... GDS receives a request from a department, which we assess, agree any changes with that department. The content's then drafted to GDS standards. And we have a content profession that works to uh, and develops these. This is informed by policy and insights from the department in question. Once that draft is reviewed and agreement is reached, that content is published on gov.uk. That's the basic process for how content is created, but what are the mechanics involved in publishing and serving it? So that's done using one of our publishing tools, Mainstream, Whitehall, and we've got some specialized publishers as well, which is there to support different formats. Um, there's a sort of manuals format, there's a collections format. I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Whenever the content is created and it's published, it's held in a content store that we run. And what happens when a request comes in is our front-end applications will pull a piece of content out, we'll stitch it together, we'll assemble it with common static elements like navigation headers, and that then gets served up. Once it's served up, it's then cached by a content delivery network. 
So a content delivery network or a CDN is a globally distributed set of servers that are optimized for serving up copies of frequently requested pages. And that works fine. I mean, that works absolutely brilliantly for flat sta static content, which doesn't change that option uh, often. So um, the many guidance pages we have on particular policies, um, it's absolutely fine for all of that. But we want gov.uk to be responsive and dynamic, and we want to be able to offer tailored content to users. So this means we can't rely purely on cache pages anymore because we can't know ahead of time what data is going to determine which snippets of content need to be stitched together when a request is made. So we've been thinking about this quite a lot. And um, our head of content, Martin Starkey, wrote a blog post on structured content. So that's about breaking content up from pages into smaller units, so chunks of content and how we would create and manage those along with the architecture needed to support pulling that together and serving it in real time or rather almost real time. That's a lot of change and we need to really think about evolving our architecture to wholesale, incremental and iterative transformation to be able to support that. Which takes us to the future. I circle back to something that we stated in a blog post recently, which was that uh, we have a clear vision for our work. We want to provide a trusted, joined up and personalized service for our users. We set ourselves five objectives to achieve that. So it's about joining the dots up for people, meeting them where they are, proactive, personalized, working across multiple channels, accessible, accurate, this is all about getting information and services to people by the shortest and easiest route possible. It's kind of funny, ironically, um, if people are spending less time on government services, that might actually be seen as a sign of success for us if they're getting what they need um, much more quickly and much more easily. So, so how are we going to do all of this? Um, a lot of it's just going back to basics, platforms and services, which is what we talk about in the GDS strategy. So doubling down on that and focusing on our core value propositions, which for what gov.uk does um, is um, publisher, the website, and a content platform. So it's essentially about breaking gov.uk down into its constituent platforms and services and then delivering them and improving on them. And it all starts with publisher. So we want to consolidate and streamline publishing into a consistent experience instead of workplace for all our users. So that's internal users in GDS and across government. These are the content creators. We want to remove some of those artificial distinctions which have been created in the current set of applications. So that's the mainstream and wiseful distinctions mentioned previously. And that's going to help us pay off some technical debt, um, but also solve some pain points that users have been experiencing. But once we've done that, we want to be able to support structured information with tagging and taxonomies for content and break that content down into smaller units. So chunks of content, which can be reused in multiple contexts. So here's a mock-up, a sneak preview of a future publisher, which could support tagging and other structured information features. And getting it right from the point of creation is really important. Once we've done this, we also want to think about how can we provide inline analytics and metrics about the performance of the content so our users across government get greater visibility and are able to make evidence-based decisions on the effectiveness of their content. Powering all of that under the hood, um, we want to think about a content platform. So a set of APIs to put content in, search and pull content out, ping notifications around for when content is published or changed, um, and this will be used by our publishing service and also by our front end. But we also want to design, and design it in a way which captures all of the core features, the core functionality of gov.uk content in a reusable way. We want to open up some possibilities for syndicating or embedding content, which is all a lot more flexible than just having a content store which only exists to meet the needs of a website. And then bringing all that together to serve it up, we need a front end that can dynamically stitch together and serve content based on data attributes in real time. So we'll be doing a lot of experiments with things like edge compute and other technologies to explore and 
innovate the best way to deliver that. To round up, a lot of that stuff will be tied together by the Gov that UK account, which we've been writing about. So identity, personalization, hand in hand with structured information to really provide that joined up experience, which is tailored um, and channel agnostic. So as much as the Government UK brand and proposition, which I talked about earlier, joined up the front end experience back in 2012, so gave that single sort of consistent experience on the front end, this is really now about joining up the back end with identity and data you know, for a truly joined up and personalized experience, which lets us meet users where they are. And of course, we want to continue improving on the existing experience for those that don't choose to create an account. So this is all going to be based on opting in and consent. And so what's next? And uh, what is next is um, lots of experimentation with accounts and personalization. So we have started doing some of this already and we're blogging about it. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more. Um, we're going to be detailing a lot of that in the open. Um, so I've already written a post which has been out there for a few weeks. Um, which touches on a lot of the stuff I'm covering in this talk. Um, there will be future posts in the series which are going to dive into more technical detail around the future publisher, the front-end experience, how we're going to do personalization, the content platform. And I've got a great team of uh, technologists, lead technical architects, lead developers, um, and seniors and others um, who are going to be working those up. So um, stay tuned for more detail on that and subscribe to our uh, subscribe to our blog to get um, to get update. So um, evolving our architecture is going to let us be more modular, more able to respond to change and be more resilient. And I'm going to uh, conclude by uh, repeating our core mission from earlier to build a simple joined up and personalized experience of government for everyone. A bit of a shout out here, gdscareers.gov.uk. If you're interested in coming along with us for this journey, it's a really exciting time to join. Have a look on there. There are some opportunities live. Um, of course, if you have a look on our blog, so the GDS blog and the inside.gov.uk blog, and you subscribe, you'll get to hear about the exciting work that we're doing. And we'll also be mentioning recruitment drives that are going along, going on along with our blog posts as well. Now we've got um, a few minutes for questions and apologies for the technical difficulties. I think we're going to have a, a little time, but remember, you can, you can follow up with me afterwards. Let me have a look in the chat. I will have to uh, cherry pick some questions and I will try not to play favorites with anyone I know. Let's see, let's see. Darren at the ONS, working on the integrated data service and leading the statistical dissemination side. Great, 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 yep. Joining up data from cross provides multiple channel offer. Great. Darren, you should definitely reach out for a chat. I think there's a lot of exciting things that are going on right now in the data space. Um, I know at ONS you're doing a huge, huge cross-government analytical piece, which is looking to, um, looking to, looking to join up uh, data from multiple different sources across government. We've got a few things going on here where we're looking to join up operational data because the account's not really going to have that much value if you can't pull in um, data attributes. Obviously, there's some overlaps here in terms of the plumbing, the data infrastructure that powers this. So we've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about that. It might be worth, um, might be worth, yeah, reaching out and having some chats with some of our uh, technical architects and uh, and other people. Um, it's still early days on this, but yeah, really exciting times. Uh, let's see. So that was Darren Barnes. So question from Ashan was: Do you use cloud services to scale? We do indeed. Um, we are moving the 70 or so applications and components of Gov.uk to a Kubernetes-based um, platform because one of the things that we found is while we were serving st static flat content, which is fronted by a content delivery uh, network, um, we don't need to have requests that directly come to our servers. That's going to change as we get into a world of more dynamic, personalized content. So cloud services and scale all the way. We have in GDS always adopted a cloud-first mentality anyway. 
So that's all good. Um, question from Bill Alder. Which type of database will be used? Um, so for our content, currently we use for our content um, NoSQL database for that. We are going to be thinking about what the right content store will be for the future architecture. I don't think it needs to probably change all that much from right now. This is a lot more about the uh, the structure we want to give the content and the, sch and the schemas around that. Let's see, probably one more. From Nikos, what's the time frame for the new publisher private beta? We're currently rejigging our teams and organizing ourselves around that, building a roadmap for future publisher and the features that need to go out. So I can't give any hard time frames on that, but I would like to see the next six to 12 months, some new features coming out around that, particularly some of the experiments we've been doing around the structured information and the tagging and taxonomy. It is just something we absolutely have to do to support this. So, uh, so uh, keep your eyes peeled. Um, one of my lead technical architects is working very closely on publishing, um, along with a few other people, should be starting work on a blog post about some of this quite soon. If you have any others that you want to follow up with me, um, Ulrika and others will share contact details. Um, and um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, and for those that know me, um, yeah, give me a shout. Thank you so much, you know, really appreciate it. Um, so just for everybody, we've obviously had a lot more questions um, than we've had time to answer for, but there will be a follow-up piece and we'll figuring out uh, what format that will be in. Um, we have saved all the questions, so uh, stay tuned for that. And also, uh, Himo will share some of your career shout shout-outs and maybe the insights and the link to the blog in our follow-up email that will go to all of you. Uh, and we have recorded the session. So for those of you who want to, uh, you know, revisit some of the uh, talk or all of it, um, we'll share that with you uh, very shortly. Uh, thanks again, Himo. Really, really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. And just uh, to finish off on, I just wanted to do a shout out to uh, our next upcoming event, which won't be a tech series, but a wow series, which is our ways of working a series, which we're going to do with Richard from Nationwide um, towards the end of October. So we've launched this uh, as a big part of uh, eSynergy for us. It's important to uh, look at not just uh, delivery uh, of our projects, but also uh, embedding best practices around ways of working. And we are inviting on a monthly or sometimes quarterly basis uh, leaders in the space, and we'll have Richard um, talk to us about the journey that Nationwide went on from a ways of working uh, in their technology team. So hopefully uh, you'll join us for that one as well. Um, other than that, uh, not much uh, else to say. Thank you so much for coming along, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Himal, again, thank you uh, for preparing and delivering the talk. Super insightful, and again, we'll share We'll share um, the recording and some of the links uh, and also the follow-up piece with your questions. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.